Hello. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a great Wednesday. So today we have a very uh, interesting topic. We have Krishna, who's uh, our CISO for Connect Secure, and he's also going to take some help from one of our uh, group companies from Tim Golden. So Tim is going to help from compliance risk, also going to chime in. Um, and we really happy to have him also join this call. Um, so between Krishna and Tim, they're going to speak about and discuss um, the new FTC regulations and its impact, potential impact for MSPs. So that's going to be the session today. Uh, as always, keep the questions coming. Uh, happy to uh, keep an eye on chat and we'll address that. Thank you very much. Krishna, take it away. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'll just share my screen now. Am I audible, Srikant? Hello? Loud and clear. Oh, okay. Good, 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 good. So let me just share my screen first and then, then we'll start off. All right, we can see your screen now. Perfect. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the call. So, we would just start with quick updates on what's been happening happening on the migration level. So, I'll have a small slide on that first, and then we'll move to the FTC regulations update. So, these are the new platform status update. Uh, as mentioned in our previous call, the first set of partners have have been migrated to the new platform and the pen testing and compliance is in progress as we speak. So the emails would be sent to them once the, uh, the testing and the compliance process uh, is completed and it's expected to go out to all of them in next few days. So this is the update from the new platform migration, which we discussed in the last uh, partner call. Now, as Srikant mentioned, uh, we have put together a few slides on the FTC regulation that was that came into, I think it's it was the first week of July when it was enforced, or last week of June when it was enforced. So what we thought was we would just put the key points on that FTC regulation, what, what it's supposed to mean to MSPs. And I would take help from Tim, who's on the call, to elaborate further in certain areas. Tim, feel free to chip in uh, in between if you feel that there is more information that you can provide, okay? Help. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. So the agenda of today's presentation is that we would look at what is the scope of this new regulation? What is the applicability? What is the objective of these safeguards? And I'm sure when you go through it, it might echo to you that it's quite similar to what other regulations are there in the market. It's just that it's focused on certain set of business and certain set of activities. And also we'll touch upon what are the minimum documentation that are required. And as an MSP, what would be your role in uh, getting this compliance to your uh, customer or yourself in some cases? Yeah. So the FTC safeguard regulation, the Federal Trade Commission regulation, applies to any entity that's engaged in financial activities or those incidental to such activities. So basically any organization that has an activity which is financial in nature is, is to be bound by compliance to FTC regulation. So it's uh, the reference of the section is given. It's 3, 314B of the FTC regulation rules. Okay. Now... The, the the famous triangle for all the security folks, the confidentiality, integrity, availability, everything is around that. Now, uh, the key focus is on data security. Data security, when I say that, it, they have to ensure that confidentiality of customer information may be financial data, customer personal information, that has to be secured. Then the integrity of data, there should be enough controls in place to ensure that the integrity of data is maintained and also to protect unauthorized access to data with uh, with proper access control. These are the main objectives of the FTC safeguards. Now the rule enlists around 13 businesses that or 13 entities uh, engaged in these kind of businesses that fall under the category of applicability. So it comes to late uh, retailer, automobile dealership, real estate appraiser, a career counselor who provides career counseling service, 
the business of printing checks and uh, selling checks you know the business that regularly wires money wire transfers money like your uh, if you have any of these customers uh, in any of these uh, type of business as your customers they are definitely bound by these ftc regulations so there are 13 listed ones that are uh, strictly bound by these regulations the ftc also dictates a minimum safeguard or minimum documentation that needs to be maintained for uh, compliance to these programs so if you look at the listed these are all familiar documents if you comply if you your, your customer comply by any of the standard compliance regulatory standards these would definitely be readily available with you because these are the minimum set of documents that that any of the compliance standards demands it's just that it has to be maintained they have to be active and all the corresponding tests and checks needs to be done on time for this to this regulation to be there so ha happy to chime in here since sure. document documentation is what please, i've been please, living, please. living and breathing for 20 plus years and so um when you actually look at the actual safe safeguard rules they talk about a wisp or a written information security policy and there's a bunch of ways you can slice and dice what a wisp is we tend to try to break them out into individual components as seen here in the bulleted list because they become a little easier to maintain a little easier to roll out to your end clients and a little easier for end users to actually understand them and adopt them. So when I think of a WISP, I think of multiple pieces of components as defined here in the list, building out in, in that entire security program, right? And so, you know, with, with working with Connect Secure, we're, you know, we're going to do some really fun stuff to be able to help you operationalize this in an effective and easy manner, right? Certainly you can go across the internet and find all kinds of templates. I tend to caution people on templates because they are basically that. They're not necessarily aware of your client's business and how they actually function. Templates are a good place as jumping off point. But, but, but having that sort of detailed knowledge about how you as an MSP operates and how your end client operates, they'll definitely need some tailoring. And you as an MSP, knowing the technical abilities of what you're doing, can really be a good catalyst for getting this documentation in place. If you've seen anything that I've been talking about over the years, it's really about building that defensibility in your end client backed up by proper policies and procedures. It's really the jumping off point for any security program. So if you have questions about how to build these, where to find them, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to help. But as in anything around compliance, needing to be governed, needing to be signed off, needing to be trained on the end users, these are all key components of building an information security program. Happy to help where I can. This is a one major component of the FTC is write down what you're doing, make sure people are aware of it and assigning the appropriate people to it, so. Thanks, Tim. I'll just move on to the yeah. next slide. Sure. Thanks, Tim. Hey, uh, we, got a, we got a couple of questions in chat. Um, if uh, Krishna and Tim, you guys yeah. could uh, go over those okay. real quick. Let me pull so, Yep. Yeah. So Adam asks, are these safeguard rules only applicable to the U.S.? So that's a really great question, right? Since this is a rule and a regulation based in the U.S., I like to boil this down to if you're touching data, whether it's personal information, health information, or in FTC, financial information, these are really good business practices, regardless of what country or continent or place you're from, right? And FTC is a really good way, along with CIS and other things, to get you sort of moving into that direction. But yes, mostly United States entities, small businesses, if you touch financial data, you should probably look at the safeguard rule, bring the lawyers in when and where appropriate. Thank you. Um, 
we also have Sean and Kevin. There's, I guess there's a 5,000 customer threshold where different rules apply. So there is a caveat all the way at the very bottom that talks about this 5,000, right? There's actually some formulas to help you calculate that. The general premise around that is if you have less than 5,000 records, then this might not apply. However, it's still good business practice, good cyber hygiene, and good defensibility. Now, how do they calculate that 5,000 and over what period of time? You can read that in the rule. We can drop the link in chat, but chances are it's going to end up applying. Once you look at sort of the client, their end client, any sub-processors of that data, be it your CPA firm or other tools, you can get to that 5,000 number very quickly at your end customer. But like I said, it's really around helping your end clients be better protected, be better, you know, aligned with things that are coming down the pipe. It's good practice. I wouldn't use that as an out to get you out of doing the work or get your client out of doing the work. And again, if you'd like to have a deeper conversation around the legality of that, happy to do that outside of this webinar. All right, I'll just move on to the next slide and we'll take a look at the questions after that, okay? Just a couple of slides to complete the presentation. So now, as an MSP, uh, what is my role as an MSP in this? How can I support my customers on that? So basically, if you look at it, uh, first and foremost, what's required is a self-assessment. Uh, that is, as an MSP, do I fall in any of these 13 listed uh, businesses that the rule lists? So if you are an MSP, whose business model includes leasing out hardware to the vendor. Or if you're an MSP where you have a shared storage where customer stores the data, yes, you have to be compliant with the FTC regulations and guidelines. So in addition to that, what you would need to maintain is what the standard practices, uh, the, the policies and practices that you have in place to ensure that all the safeguards that you have implemented works, they are tested on a periodic basis. You have uh, a vulnerability scan and an assessment as per the policy that, that works. You have an identified person for the uh, customer security, or you have an uh, identified person on the customer side also available who is accountable for the security for that. So those with clear roles and responsibilities should be, should be identified and documented. So when you have these policies and documents in place, these would be covered in those policies and documents in place. And uh, also maintain all the artifacts that are needed to adhere to all the monitoring requirements as put forward by the SLA and the service contracts that you have with the customer. So fundamentally, you have to ensure that all the implemented controls work for to safeguard the customer data. They are implemented and they are work working and you have to have artifacts to prove that in the time time of audit and that's that's in a nutshell the whole whole thing is about tim if you want to chip in furthermore on on all, any of these on the rules i think you're on mute tim how many times are we going to keep talking with people on mute so you think <laughs> by now i'd get the hang of being on zoom right sure. so, so as you mentioned does this apply to me as an MSP and should I follow it? Yes, we talked about, do you store data? Do you have data centers? Like, do you have the data? It probably applies. Uh, for MSPs that provide financing, it absolutely applies. And so when you look at your MSP as a business, it's all about the data and do you have access to it? And again, back to building that defensibility in your own cyber practice, right? And how do we do that? Well, documentation, related artifacts, things like Connect Secure, being able to do vulnerability management, being able to do some of those, uh, I hate to use the word penetration test because we all know that is a stigma, but being able to track where the data is, being able to track the vulnerabilities around that stuff, doing the things that you should be doing anyways, um, as well as a big, a big component is having a named individual in your business. Now, there's debate on whether or not your MSP can be the named individual for your clients. Since I'm not a lawyer, I'm not going to dig too deep into that, but I would certainly consider 
having a named individual, at least in your own industry and in your own MSP so that when these things happen, when, you know, if data is breached, somebody is ultimately responsible. One of the things that we do in our MSP is work with our clients to identify the buck stops here with this particular compliance individual. They don't necessarily have to be a cybersecurity expert. They don't have to be a compliance expert, but they are the person ultimately responsible for ensuring that you as the MSP are doing the things to protect them. And I'm seeing all kinds of questions in chat that I can't keep up with at the moment, but I dropped the, the, the link to the rule, uh, part one, uh, 314 in chat as well, if you wanted more information. So uh, I think that was the last slide. With that, I'll uh, end the screen share and start addressing the questions if they've not already been addressed. Okay, so I'll just share, stop the screen share now. Sure. So I see Steve has mentioned uh, another product uh, with from another vendor. There are lots of products in the space to help you operationalize an FTC practice. Um, you know, that's why we're developing these partnerships between Compliance Risk and Connect Secure is we want to be able to bring those things to you as an MSP to be able to do that at scale, right? So very familiar with ScalePad, Lifecycle Insights, good friend of ours, uh, familiar with Control Map as well. Again, as an MSP doing your own vendor due diligence and looking at the space and looking at the experts, obviously wanting you to do your own vendor due diligence. Let's see, what else? Blah, blah, blah. Kind of digging through some of these here real quick. Uh, with the 5,000, other questions. So uh, Kevin talks about vulnerability assessments, pen testing, uh, IRP, incident response plan, and all of those things are available uh, through compliance risk, incident response plan, and obviously the vulnerability stuff through Connect Secure. do we have here? Yeah, so that's a good point, Steve, about um, your RMM has access to the data. Again, back to that scope and applicability. If you can touch the data or you store the data or you can get to the data, chances are that it's going to be applicable to you as an MSP. Again, back to it's good cyber hygiene and good practice to do some of this stuff on your own, whether you're following FTC or you're following CIS, some prescribed framework. What else do we have? Kevin makes a point about not signing off on uh, insurance forms. Uh, again, not an insurance guy, but maybe a good practice to at least assist in your, uh, in your clients with those insurance forms. Uh, how does FTC tie into that? Mm, not quite sure where exactly. There's probably some overlaps on the insurance forms in the FTC safeguards rules and GLBA as well. <clears throat> Let's see. What other questions do people have? I think we've gone through most of them. We've reached the last question and... We did miss, uh, Adam had a question asking if these uh, FTC safeguards go along with PCI DSS or if that will oh. close it. Is there any overlap there? There, there, there it is. I, I, I see it now, Adam. So yeah. obviously different frameworks have different requirements. Um, there's probably overlap. I'm not a big fan of cross mapping and doing those overlapping exercises because I feel like they're too subjective. Um, <laughs> Excuse me, but for those that are PCI DSS experts, you can probably find a lot of similarities between the two frameworks. Again, back to documentation. If it's not written down and it's not governed, it didn't happen and it doesn't exist. And fortunately, with compliance risk, we can help you build out that practice and that process. So just to add to that, Kim, we did an exercise of in one of the earlier presentations, we did a controls mapping. Uh, mm -hmm. against each of these standards, like a crosswalk. So if you do yeah. that, you would definitely see that there are a lot of standards or policies that you have developed for PCI DSS that you can reuse here. 
you know so uh, uh, i'm sure with the set of mandatory documentation that would definitely be an overlap of what is needed for the ftc if you are a pci dss compliant right yeah. but it does not cover all what pci dss demands that's probably that's probably the the explanation for that yeah there's definitely way more controls and stuff in pci than there is in ftc <laughs> yeah true Uh, so, Mark, good question. GLBA. Yes, it is an extension of GLBA. For those that don't know, the, the acronym guy always gets the acronyms wrong, right? But, Graham, Graham Leach and Bailey Act. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, so, so they do, uh, uh, in part, take alongside GLBA, yes. So I don't know, uh, Shiva or Peter, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of how we're operationalizing this with Connect Secure and compliance risk? Or I don't know, does this go for an hour, half hour? Do you like, I don't know if you wanted to kind of talk a little bit about that or not while we wait for other questions. Yeah. Um, so usually these, you know, usually these Wednesday calls are about development updates. Yep. Um, as our development team is, you know, heads down, hard at work, coming out with version three um that were slated to have ready for you know beta testing in mid-september um we wanted to kind of you know fill in the slots with some some more information on some of the side projects we're doing so uh one of our most recent integrations has been with compliance risk.io um which tim here is the ceo of so we have a partnership now um and essentially what what we're doing is we're taking the asset information from Connect Secure, and then you know Tim's able to bring that over into his policy and documentation management um, to sort of help facilitate the the policies and procedures of good compliance management. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to talk on that integration a little bit, Tim. Sure. So thank you for that, Peter. So when we look at a control framework, whether it's NIST, CIS, FTC, any of that for that matter all of them have some type of asset management component. And so when we think about asset management, we need to first discover where those assets are. And while, as you all know, Connect Secure does a really great job of discovering that stuff across the enterprise, across internal networks and devices and Azure and Intune, and all that fun stuff. So gathering that data of where are my assets and are they up to date? But the next step of enterprise or asset management is, is the data right? Do my clients even know about it? Do my clients uh, acknowledge and sign off that they reviewed this alongside you? And so the integration that we built for you, like if we take the RMM, if we take an asset list out of most of the tools that exist in the space, you might get an Excel document and then what? So what we've done with our integration with Connect Secure is automate that entire process. Drop in your API key, set the schedule on which this should be automated. By the way, CIS says it should be done monthly. Set that schedule. Polygon, our compliance product, is going to go out to that source of truth. It is going to pull down that list for you as the MSP. It is going to red, yellow, green, new suspect duplicate, duplicate, and show you that list in the proper format for asset management based on CIS. And it's going to be able to quickly tell you why are there 20 new devices that we don't know about? Or how come Tim's laptop is listed in there 15 times with different names? That gives you the MSP to, the opportunity to actually do asset governance and asset management. Pull the list down, review it click quickly, make sure it is correct, and then have your client acknowledge and sign off. Yeah, we agree. We added 30 new computers this month, or we removed 20, you know, 20 email addresses this month. And we've automated that entire process through our in integration with Connect Secure to streamline that for you as the MSP. 
all version control, change management, audit log history, signatures along the way. That is just think, one of the first proof of concepts that we're building out with Connect Secure. Oh, I think uh, Tim does a question from Kevin. So what if we only house a client backup that have to adhere to the safeguard rule? Does that put yeah. us... We, does that put us in the requirement as well? Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming it. I'm assuming yes. Again, not a lawyer, but you have the data, right? And I don't know how you're doing your backups, whether they're whether they're uh, encrypted, immutable, all that fun stuff. But the reality is, if you're storing that data and there's a way that it could be breached, yeah, you want to be able to protect it, regardless Absolutely. of the rules and regulations. Right. So do we have any more questions? I think that's a question from Adam. I assume you are using an API to look into the Connect Secure. What data will you be pulling on your API and uh, use SOC so, type of certified? Yeah, so Adam, great question, right? So the initial proof of con so the to answer the SOC 2 ISO question. And I get this a lot during our calls. We have been building FedRAMP moderate web-based applications for 17 years. When I built Polygon, when I built Compliance Risk, we applied the same mentality of FedRAMP equivalent to what we're building. For us to get FedRAMP is a lengthy and costly pro process, but we're heading in that direction. In the meantime, we already started to engage in our SOC 1, SOC 2, and SOC 3, along with ISO 27001, which will obviously, as you're aware, take a little time to get those legal attestations. So we built this with FedRAMP in mind because I have a lot of federal government clients. We are going to get our SOC 2, SOC 3 report that will be publicly available on our website. And we are going to get our ISO 27001. All of that is slotted to be done before Connect, I hope. <laughs> if not, it will be done by the end of the year. So that should answer your are we certified question. Now, as far as how we do this integration, uh, grab your API key from Connect Secure, plop it into our platform. Obviously, it's safe, secured, encrypted, all that fun stuff. Uh, and we have a I can get into the gory details about how we do that on a separate call. But grab your API key, map your client in Polygon to, uh, to Connect Secure, set the schedule, and then once a week, once a month, once a quarter, manage the assets. And as far as what data, right now we started with assets, so hardware assets. We're in the process of doing this for software assets. We're in the process of doing this for Microsoft uh, API, Graph API, so anything in the Microsoft ecosystem. And we're doing this with a SaaS product to identify SaaS assets. I don't want to plug another vendor on the call, but we're doing this with four or five different asset categories of data. Right. Hopefully, Adam, uh, hopefully Adam, that answered your question. I think there's a question. Are the recordings available? Yes, all the recordings of weekly meetings are available on our YouTube channel, and uh, you can all the previous ones are available as well. I think there's Sorry, a question from. Didn't mean to hijack your call, but if people are asking, I'm happy to answer. I popped that link for Shiba's YouTube channel uh, in the chat there. So yeah. oh, okay. usually a few days afterwards, he'll he'll upload it there. Adam, to answer your question, we are not FedRAMP certified or authorization to operate under FedRAMP at this point in time. Probably someday in the future. Again, time, like I, it's, yeah, it's kind of a big thing. It's... FedRAMP is where we want to go, obviously, because I have federal government clients in our MSP and pushing to GovCloud, GCC, all that fun stuff, but we're not there yet. Okay. So I uh, 
I think if there are no further questions, we can actually close the call. So thank you all for attending the uh, the weekly call. So we, we'll be back next week with uh, more updates on what's happening on the product update front. And also, Tim, thank you very much for joining yeah. the session and helping us out with the questions and answers and also the insight to your product. So thank hope you. this has given a overview or brief of what FTC means and FTC is meant for the market and for the customers. So we'll be back with more updates next week. And thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you for joining the call. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Nice, nice talking to you.